Hi friends, this is Frederick Vermling, and here I briefly want to touch upon the topic of redundant and non-redundant genes in the CRISPR screen context. I think this is a concept that most people working in this field are aware of, but it's something that comes up as a discussion topic often, so I wanted to address it. And I'm going to use a ski resort map here as an, as an image to explain this, as you can see. I will briefly touch upon these papers, so if you're interested, read more. Um, in those. Um, so here is an image uh, that was, or a figure that was made by Baish in the lab for the review that I specified before, and it's describing a CRISPR screen. And of course, a CRISPR screen is something you do to understand some kind of cellular behavior. Typically, you would uh, generate the genetic heterogeneity using CRISPR, targeting many different targets. And then try to understand, okay, is there any genetics or is there any mutation that you can introduce that could be explaining uh, the behavior you study, basically. But, uh, and I'm not going to go into more detail on that, but one thing that's important to know here, and one of the strengths with, with working with these type of screens, is that we typically target one gene per cell, right? Which means that we can target a lot of gene in a fairly small cell population. But a caveat to that is that we can only identify genes that have a non-redundant role in the studied phenomenon. And, and what do I mean by that? Well, and here I come to the ski resort. So this is a map of a ski resort in Sweden, the biggest one, I think, although compared to other parts of the world, maybe not that uh, big. So if you think about that, you're on the top here and you want to get down, right? there's several different ways you can do it. So there's, there's a non-redundancy related to that, right? Same thing if you're here and you want to go to here, you can go bo, go by slope, slope number 80 and 81. So they are non-redundant, right? If this is blocked, you can take this one. Right? However, if you're here and you want to go down here, you're kind of depending on that 58 is open unless you're very adventurous, right? You go outside of the, of the slopes. Uh, so this serves a non-redundant role here, right? If your aim is to go from here to here. And I can't but kind of compare these to, to the kind of signaling pathway that many of us are, are studying here, exemplified by the TLR4 signaling pathway, where we have all of these kind of signaling uh, components involved. And we could, and, and there's different ways that, that you can imagine signaling occurring when a ligand is added. And the point here with the CRISPR screen and, or identifying these non redundant targets is that if we knock out things that turn out to be non redundant, to be central for the phenotype, these could actually be really good drug targets potentially, because if you in if you knock them out with in a screen and you affect your phenotype that you're studying, they likely could be drugged by some sort of inhibitor to achieve the same thing. Um, so I want to second part here. I want to show uh, one example of how we've done that in the lab. And here was a, a, a study where we're interested in understanding how signaling pathways involve an LPS was added to macrophages related, releasing uh, cytokines or chemokines. And here I'm going to show data for CSF3. And um, this was a supplemental figure to a paper that, that we published earlier this year. So, uh, so that in the lab uh, approached this um, by uh, targeting several uh, components here, not all of them, but broadly trying to identify the, the broad strokes here, which of these pathways are more important than others. And he generated guidance targeting all of these genes, a custom hypothesis driven screen. And he uh, infected a macrophage cell line, seeded them one cell per well. So this is an arrayed type of screen setting. Let them expand in each well, in these 96 well plates. And when they were, had rich confluence, of course, in each cell, since they come from one cell in each well, they have the same genotype, right? Then he added LPS took supernatant after roughly 24 hours and did an ELISA for CSF3 secretion. And what he could find was that the cells produce good CCF3 levels robustly after LPS stimulation, but he could find some wells where there was no CCF3 uh, secretion at all. And when he sequenced those guidernase, and here we're talking simple Sanger sequencing, so very straightforward approach, uh, he could identify a couple of genes that were, when you knock them out, a couple of guidernase that when they're found in the wells, they, they don't, that corresponded to cells not producing CCF3. So MIDE88 and IREC4, part of a complex up here, suggesting that this is the starting point. 
AKT3, maybe something involved here, although we, we have, didn't go further into that, and rel A and NF kappa B1, which then are part of the, uh, the, the canonical NF kappa B pathway. So if you knock out my data in IRX4, no CSF3 secretion. If you knock out P50 in rel A, so P50 is also the same thing as NF kappa B1, uh, no CSF3. So you could kind of nicely identify here. Here was a very simple and uh, experiment, but we could start to dissect this very, very nicely. So the conclusions from this is that if multiple proteins or genes can perform a similar task, these genes will likely not be identified in CRISPR screen as the redundant. So coming into this redundant, non-redundant concept. <clears throat> and this means, of course, in, in uh, that traditional CRISPR screens do not really identify all biology in a study system, because actually when we stimulate the cells, here, all of these things are likely going to be firing, right? So if you're interested in exactly what's going on, um, you're not going to find it, but it's going to you're going to find uh, things that are not redundant, right? As mentioned, if you're interested in in more bio using CRISPR screens to identify more biology, and uh, we we talk about that in in the review I referred to earlier, and uh, you can con con consider doing combinatorial screens where you're targeting several genes uh, at the same time, and and, and the John Doan's lab at at Broad has done some great work on that that you can look into. Um, you can do screens in cells that are deficient in all are deficient in particular genes. So if you if you know that one gene could be involved, um, you can knock it out and then perform a screen on that background to see okay is this changing what is going on here. And of course, if you're interested in biology, I think combining CRISPR A to CRISPR cut to CRISPR I screens, so CRISPR A of course being activating instead of knocking out or inhibiting um, genes, that that could really give you an increased biological understanding. And finally, of course, uh, I think the main take home here is that, sure, non, we only find non-redundant genes, but they're likely going to be good potential drug targets because we already know that if you knock them out, that your, your phenotype is, is affected that you're studying. So an inhibitor targeting the same gene is likely going to be a good way of suppressing that. Um, then, of course, not all proteins are good drug targets per se, and that's something we also discuss in the review. So... That was it. Uh...